Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen to reveal the chapter titles and starting points of each section. In this week's Casual Friday podcast, I have tidbits. I have an update on my vintage 1960s sweater uh, where I'm going to talk about some strategies and experiments that I've been doing to decide which sorts of finishing techniques I want to use at which point. And then I'll have a sewing update as well. So let's get started. This came up in my feed this week. For the second time, it came up a few weeks ago and I honestly cannot remember <laughs> if I told you guys about it. I don't always share everything that comes up in my feed. So if I have told you about this, I apologize. Just skip to the next one. This is a clothing scrapbook that a woman named Hannah Ditzler Alsbach uh, kept. She was the daughter of a farmer who moved to Naperville, Illinois from Pennsylvania. She was not rich or socially prominent, but became an artist, teacher, librarian, and is considered Naperville's first historian. So the scrapbook that she kept is one that many women kept back in the 19th century, which has little pieces of fabric that were used in different items of clothing, and then they'd write a description about the item that they wore uh, and uh, what maybe what it looked like. But she really took this uh, to heart. And she started it in 1887, but she included scraps of clothing and information about items that she wore that went back to before the Civil War. So she really was a historian. She had drawings and sketches of the clothing items. She went into a lot of detail and she kept the scrapbook going for many, many decades. Most women who kept scrapbooks like this didn't keep them for very long. So that was what I found so interesting. So even if I did tell you guys about this before, um, this this is, I think, a different article than the one I shared, I think, I think. But I will leave it down in the show notes below. This next tidbit came to me in my Instagram feed. It was from Corey of IROC Nets. She is a knit designer here in the Twin Cities. And she often posts little cartoons or quotations that are knitting related, often that have uh, humor in them. This particular one was a quotation uh, attributed to Elizabeth Zimmerman. Knitting is formed by a series of loops pulled through loops to the end of time or to desired length. By picking up loops and working in the opposite direction, you are really picking up the concavities between the loops and it is sheer unexpected witchcraft that stocking stitch and garter stitch will permit such an anomaly. Be grateful for this and don't expect any more. So Elizabeth Zimmerman is the, the woman I've been talking about in Casual Fridays the, the past month or so. She's the topic of a discussion on a podcast called Yarns from Yin Hu. It's an eight part discussion uh, with a woman who got a PhD on Elizabeth Zimmerman. So Elizabeth Zimmerman wrote several books, which I have on my shelf. She, she wrote quite a few, but uh, probably the, one of the most famous is Knitting Without Tears. This was her first book published in, I believe, 1970 or 71. So she has a very conversational style of explaining how knitting works. It was really her goal to help knitters understand how knitting works uh, so that they could ch take charge of their knitting and they could design their own items and they could, they could take their ideas and run with them. So this next tidbit came to me. It's on one of my feeds, either Instagram or Twitter, possibly both of them. And it's this photograph of a wool swimsuit from the early part of the 20th century. Um, it's in the, the holdings of the University of Glasgow. Anytime I see a photograph of one of these old style uh, wool swimsuits, I think of my grandmother. 
She was born on a farm in Iowa in 1900. She went all the way through high school and she became a school teacher. She was qualified to teach in a rural uh, schoolhouse that went up to eighth grade. And then the family moved to San Diego in 1920. After they got to San Diego, she started classes at San Diego Normal College, which is a normal college was the name for a teacher's college. So she wanted to get an actual college degree and be certified to teach uh, all levels of school, not just up through eighth grade. And part of the curriculum was that she had to take physical education. And one unit of physical education was swimming. So the college worked with a man named Henry Gunther who had, a, they called it a swimming bath or the bathhouse or something like that, but it was basically a swimming pool. And he taught uh, the students how to swim. So when she showed up for class, they were going to give her a bathing suit to wear, which she had never had something like that. You know, she was born in this rural area. She always had to wear high necked items and they handed her this wool bathing suit. And she said, oh no, I couldn't possibly wear something that small. I need something bigger. And so they gave her a larger swimsuit, which of course just had enormous armholes and hung right off of her. But, but in that very first swimming lesson, she was so strong from having lived on the farm and she was considered her, her father's boy. Uh, of, of, of the three girls, she was the boy. And so she more frequently helped him out in the fields than helped her mother inside the house. She was incredibly strong. And in that first lesson, they were standing on the pool and they had to bend over with their faces in the water and they were just learning the arm strokes. And she actually pulled herself off of her feet and across the pool and she was so excited about it and she just loved it. Well, she continued taking swimming lessons from Henry Gunther and she joined his the swim team. They had this uh, swim team called the Sunset Swim Club. And within a couple of years, she was one of the fastest short distance swimmers on the West Coast. And she was no longer wearing wool swimsuits. Instead, she was wearing silk swimsuits that were very uh, figure forming. And she would slather herself up with beer, uh, bear grease in order to swim uh, the weeds because they were out in the ocean. They weren't in an indoor swimming pool like you'd have today. So she continued to swim all the way up into, well into her late 80s. I just, I just love thinking about that and thinking about my grandmother and what an athlete she was and how certain she was that, that the wool swimsuit that they wanted her to wear was not going to be appropriate at all. This next tidbit came to me in my, the email newsletter from Claire Parks and the Wool Channel. I've talked about the Wool Channel a few times in the past month or so. It is a new website from Clara Parks, who is an expert on all things wool. And it's a free newsletter that you can sign up for. And once a week, she'll send uh, information about what's going on in the world of of wool. If you're a paid subscriber to the website, then you also get access to things like the monthly live stream video, as well as the community of forums on different wool topics where you can talk to other people who are wool enthusiasts. But what this video is, it's from, I think it's from the 1960s. There had been a court case where a man who was a sheep farmer said that some of his sheep had gotten mixed up, uh, had joined another flock and that those were his sheep. And they said, well, how could you possibly know that? And he's like, well, I recognize them. And so this film, uh, what they wanted to do was test this idea if a sheep farmer could really identify sheep that were or were not his. And so they got these three sheep and they marked them on the bellies with tar and they introduced them to his flock. And it's a big bunch of sheep. <laughs> They're all the same breed. And he's just going through and he's like, oh, here's one. And then he's like, oh, here's one. You know, and he found all three of them. And they're like, well, what, what was that? And he's like, I don't know. I just knew that they didn't belong here. And he's like, I, I just... He's like, I don't know, maybe it was something in their face that maybe it looked different, but it just, he just knew them. It's, you know, it's like if you recognize somebody 
down the street based on the way they walk, I imagine. And you're like, oh, that's, I know who that is, even though you can't see their face, maybe. Uh, so then they were testing him on his own sheep. And they're like, do your sheep have names? He goes, no, they have a letter and a number. And they're like, okay, well, what's this one? Oh, well, that one's, you know, S52. And then they capture another one. Well, that's, you know, T135. That's the daughter of the first one. And her mother, you know, her, her daughter is here too. You know, he, he knew every one of them. And, and he also said, you know, I might make a mistake, but he didn't make a mistake um, at all. But it's pretty fun to watch. It's amazing. Um, so I'll leave a link down below. So I've been making some progress on my 1960s vintage sweater. If you're new here and you don't uh, know about this project that I have, I have a long-term project that I'm working on where I'm knitting a sweater from each decade of the 20th century. So I've done 1890, 1904, 1918, 1922, 1938. My intention had been to do 1940, but I a couple of months ago I came across some vintage uh, knitting kits from the 1960s and I ended up buying three of them. The way that they were originally sold would they would have had uh, a pattern, enough yarn to complete the pattern, in some cases um, a grow grain ribbon and matching buttons to go along with it and then there was a matching skirt length of hand woven wool tweed um, and so one of the kits was was absolutely complete. It had uh, it had two patterns uh, the grow grain ribbon, the buttons, the uh, eight balls of yarn, and the fabric. Didn't really care for that color combination, but I really liked the pattern, one of the patterns that came in that kit. And so that is the pattern that I'm using to knit my sweater. The yarn that I'm using is from a kit that's a different brand, and it's a slightly heavier yarn. It's a four-ply fingering weight yarn where the original kit had uh, what would be, it was a two-ply yarn, I mean, in, in terms that it actually had two, two strands that are applied together, but the yarn weight is considered what's called a three-ply or a light fingering weight. So in order to knit this, the sweater pattern using the yarn that I wanted to use, which is a little heavier, I was able to see that I could actually knit a smaller size and use the stitch, those stitch counts with my uh, little, slightly thicker yarn that had slightly looser, uh, not really looser gauge, but just um, not as fine a gauge. So rather than working at eight stitches per inch as per the pattern, I'm working at seven and a half stitches per inch, and then I can use uh, one size smaller. One of the things that I have been concerned about though is having enough yarn and uh, I've been weighing the balls of yarn as I've been uh, finishing each piece and I've been really worried about it. Uh, it. It's going to be very close. The pattern does come with two versions. You can do a three quarter length sleeve or a full length sleeve. I'm hoping to be able to do a full length sleeve. So there are a few things about, a few choices that I have as a knitter when I'm knitting any pattern. Uh, they don't tell me how to cast on. They don't tell me uh, what method of seaming to use, that sort of thing. Those are choices that I can make. And on top of that, I can choose, maybe I want to make some modifications in to the instructions. So for example, for shoulder shaping, this is worked flat in pieces, bottom up. So when you get to the shoulders, uh, you start binding off at the shoulder edge. Uh, you bind off some of the stitches, work all the way to the neck, come back, then bind off a few more stitches, work to the neck, come back, etc., etc. And so that gives you a sweater that's longer at the neck edge, and that that matches the shaping of the human body. Um, but in with those kinds of instructions, that produces what's called a stair step edge. And there are, but there are other ways of getting that shaping without a stair step edge. And one of those is to use short rows, which I've done uh, videos on how you can convert stair step shaping to short row shaping, which I will link to up here, but I also link down in show notes. So that was one of the, the situations uh, where I have a choice or I made a choice to do something differently than what the pattern said. But one of the choices that I had to make is one that I would have had to make no matter what because they don't 
instruct on how to do this, and that is how to sew the button band to the body of the sweater. So I'm going to do an overhead where I kind of talk you through uh, the the choices that I that I was thinking about and what I tried, and then ultimately uh, what I ended up with. And then the next thing was. Um, was with the shoulder shaping, I, I ran into some an unexpected obstacle. And so I will talk to you a little bit about uh, how I got around that obstacle. Uh, I still, I had a number of choices and I made a decision about which choice I was going to make uh, for that as well. So showing you last week, I had the two fronts uh, to my sweater and I needed to do the button band and then the yoke. So uh, so I've gotten the yoke almost done. I have um, all of the shaping has been done. I need to work a few uh, straight rows and then I need to do the shoulder shaping. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this button band situation works and then the the decision making process that I made when I decided how I was going to seam this. So for every piece of this sweater you cast on an even number of stitches with the smaller needles and you work in net one pro one ribbing. So you're always starting with a net one and then you end with a pro one. That means when I am seaming the back of the sweater to the front of the sweater, the edge stitch here is going to be a purl and the edge stitch here is a knit and I can take a full stitch from each side and I still maintain the continuity of the ribbing pattern across the seam. Um, so I'll get rid of a purl, I'll get rid of a knit, and then instead I'll have a knit here and a purl here, and it will just maintain that continuity. So every piece starts with a knit and ends with a purl. For the fronts, all of the stitches needed for the front ribbing are cast on, including the ones that will be used for the button band or the buttonhole band. Someone asked me about this uh, in the comments, a week or so ago, what is the advantage of, of doing that, of, ca of working them and leaving them on a hold, rather than why not just only cast on the number of stitches that you need for the front and then do the whole button band separately and, and seam it? What would be the advantage of doing this? So the advantage would be that you have this very smooth edge and you don't have to seam anything in here that you don't need to seam something um, and you don't risk it getting a little uh, dip in the edge where, where the seam would come together. Now a lot of people really dislike having to sew a, a button band on, but this type of button band allows that stitch uh, direction of, of stitches to be knit. Everything is knit in the same direction. So this is a very traditional way of doing it. It really uh, wasn't until maybe the mid-century when people started sometimes picking up stitches along the edge and knitting perpendicularly to that. And still in the UK, a lot of patterns still have you do the, the bands separately. The question that I had to answer for myself was how was I going to seam this together? What type of seaming method was I going to use? My default method is mattress stitch. Uh, it's the one I prefer. It's not the only method. And I wasn't sure exactly which type of mattress stitch I wanted. When you have two knit stitches, one on each edge, you have a choice of doing a full stitch from each edge, like you would in the case of uh, down here where, where you're seaming a knit and a purl together. You can take a full stitch or you could take a half a stitch when you have a knit on each side. So you eliminate that half stitch and you actually end up with something that looks still like a full stitch along the seam. Ultimately, that is what I ended up doing is, is I ended up using a half stitch seam. So this column of stitches right here is the seam. This is the half a stitch um, from over here and the other is the half a stitch from the ribbing. So, um, so this column of stitches is, is the actual seam. And on the back side, you can see that uh, it isn't any uh, thicker, like the seam isn't any bulkier than the ribbing is. The ribbing is coming forward from the surface of the, of the pearl because the knits always want to come forward and the pearls want to recede. So it's not any bulkier. 
I had originally tried it with a full stitch from each side and it, and it was quite it was quite bulky and it was bulky in a way that I didn't like on a piece of fabric that was going to remain flat on the front of the garment. I don't mind a full stitch seam uh, along the side because that's the, a part of the body that curves around and that adds some stability to the fabric, but I really didn't want that bulkiness right here on the front of the fabric. I did experiment also with an overcast or whip stitch, uh, which creates a pretty flat seam, but it also is very visible and I just don't like the way it looks. Now I was trying the, the, a full stitch from each side at first because for the right front, this piece of fabric also starts with a knit and ends with a purl, which means that the 12 stitches for the buttonhole band starts with a knit and ends with a purl. So that means I don't have two knit stitches along the edge. I have a purl stitch and a knit stitch, which would mean I would need a full stitch. So what I've decided to do is that when I work the buttonhole band, I'm going to cast on using a backwards loop right here at the edge so that I will have 13 stitches. And so from the right side of the work, I'll have a knit at, at this end and a knit at this end. And so that will give me uh, two knit stitches along the edge and I can do the half stitch along here as well. Uh, I'll just uh, skip one of the, the increases when I do the shaping along the, the front here. A couple of weeks ago, I was telling you that I was planning on knitting the sleeves either completely top down or partially top down. Uh, and I needed to do some swatching experiments. And so um, I, I showed you, you know, my swatching experiments. This one, this swatch represents <clears throat> the body of the sweater where there is some underarm uh, shaping for a while and then the, the armhole goes straight. So I can show you. So that's what it looks like in the actual sweater. You can see I have the bind off, then I have this long place of underarm shaping, and then it just goes straight up. So then what happens on the sleeve is that you have the same kind of decreases, but they're mirrored. So in both cases, the decreases are two stitches away from the edge. And at the point where you no longer need to decrease on the body, they, they switch the placement of the decreases on the sleeve so that you, you have those matching decreases and then when they disappear on the body, they shift them and they have you put them in the edge. And this was a situation I'd never seen before in a sweater uh, pattern. I had seen instructions where they might tell you to decrease at each end and not telling you what kind of decrease or where to place them and leaving that up to you. But I'd never seen a situation where they were very specifically said, put them here and now put them over here. So I was really intrigued by that and interested. So because of this very specific shaping and because I was worried about the amount of yarn I have and whether or not I have enough to do an entire sleeve, I had two options. One was to cast on for the sleeve a right at the base of the sleeve cap and knit it bottom up and then come back using, so I'd use a provisional cast on like Judy's Magic cast on and then I could come back to those live stitches and knit the sleeve in the opposite direction um, because that works like Elizabeth Zimmerman was talking about earlier in Tidbits, you can work in the opposite direction and it looks perfectly fine uh, and, but I would able to be, I would be able to manage the um, the yarn and, and see how, how far it would take me. Well, the other option was to knit the entire sleeve top down. So to reverse the shaping that you get with this. And I was able to get a pretty good uh, version of that using lifted increases coming down. So, th so this line that looks like decreases, it's really, it's, it was really knit in this direction using increases. Um, so what I decided was I, I did want it to do the version where I, I do the cap bottom up and then work the rest of the sleeve top down. And in fact, what I'm going to do with the sleeves is that when I come back to the live stitches, I'm going to join in the round. I'm going to work the sleeves in the round and eliminate two stitches in the sleeves that would have gotten lost in the seam. And that's going to save me 
close to 700 stitches between the two, sti uh, the two sleeves. And so if things are very, very close, that might just be enough. It's a couple extra grams of yarn that I'll be able to save because of that. Um, but I, I wanted to do an experiment where I actually looked to see what it would look like when they were sewn together. So here's another swatch. Again, this represents the body of the sweater and this represents the sleeve cap. So you can see how well the decreases are mirrored. The seam is in the middle right here. It's a, a basic a mattress stitch. And then you can see how the seam worked in that shaping here where the shaping was done right in the edge. And I thought that looked so much nicer than I expected it to, to look. I think in part because they were very specific about which decrease to use at the edge to make sure I was using one that was leaning this way at this edge and not just using a knit two together at both edges, using a knit two together this, this way might not have given um, as nice a result. So I, I do like swatching to experiment. Um, and with the button band, I tried different seaming methods. Uh, but one, one place where I just sort of drew the line about experimenting and trying a few different things is with the shoulder shaping. So my plan, my plan was that after I knit my four rows of ribbing, I was going to do short row shaping um, for the shoulder. And then the plan was I would keep those stitches live and I would use a three needle bind off to join the live stitches of the front to the live stitches of the left back shoulder. Um, but first I had to finish the back. I was about 20 rows of knitting short of finishing the back. I'd gotten sick of it uh, about a month ago. I put it to the side. Um, so I needed to do 20 rows of stockinette and then I needed to do the shoulder shaping for the back. So I did my 20 rows and this time I had to do short row uh, shaping simultaneously on both shoulders. I've done videos on how to convert um, stair step bind offs on a single shoulder to short row uh, shaping. Um, but I've also done one where you have to do both shoulders at the same time, where you're not just working with one. In the, in the front of a sweater, you usually have some neck shaping here that interrupts the two shoulders. So you're doing them separately, but on the back, you're frequently doing them at the same time. So I was thinking about, okay, how am I gonna do this? I was kind of planning it out and I was looking at the numbers and I realized that the bind off numbers in the original instructions were not the same for the back as they were for the front. And I thought, is that, are there different numbers of rows? What's going on? No, nope. there was both four sets of bind offs. On the front, on the front, the bind offs were 13 stitches at a time because there were 52 stitches all together. On this, there was nine stitches three times and then 10 stitches. There was only 37 stitches. And so when I first saw that, I thought, what have I done wrong? Oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? And I realized that what it was is a situation where I have two different fabrics that I'm working with. I'm working with a Knit One Pro One ribbing done on size zero needles, which is a two millimeter. And I have stockinette, which is done on a US two needle, uh, which is a 2.75 millimeter. The width of this shoulder, which is just, just over five inches, um, is 37 stitches in stockinette on the larger needles, but it's 52 stitches over Knit One Pro One with the smaller needles. So that was the point where I was like, okay, theoretically this is possible to do a three needle bind off where you have more stitches on one needle than the other. It would take some calculating to figure out how to do that, but it would also take some swatching and experimentation to see what the result looked like and whether or not I wanted to bother with it. And what I decided was I did not want to bother with it. Sometimes I'm very happy to experiment. In this case, I was not. And I think in some, some regards, it's because this is a situation that I have never been in. I have been in situations where I have a different stitch count for the front than for the back because maybe I've, I'm working in cables. And usually in that case, in the last cable crossing, I can reduce the number of stitches before I do my bind off so that I do have the same number of stitches on each side. 
So this was just going to take some calculating and some experimentation that I just didn't feel like doing. So instead what I did was I just went ahead and bound off uh, this edge and then I could continue working uh, the button band, which is it's going to come around uh, to form the, the neck band at the back of the neck. So uh, I just wanted to get past that and carry on going forward. So sometimes I'm very happy to swatch and other times not so much. Sewing update. So my goal this week was to draft a skirt sloper for a straight skirt, but using a technique that was different, using somebody else's instructions. They're very, a lot of overlap, but they slightly different things. The first skirt sloper I did had one dart on each side of the front and one on each side of the back and then in the center back seam functioned as a dart. So you essentially had one big dart and two small darts in the back and then two in the front. And that one was okay, um, but I had no idea of how to tell if it was lining up correctly or not. Um, the instructions for that sloper were really aimed at people who were design students or wanted to design for the industry and not really geared at the home sewer and who needs to fit themselves. So this uh, version that I'm doing now is from Alexandra Morgan from in-house in -house pattern designs, in-house pattern designs studio, something like that. I'll leave a link down below. So she is aimed at the person who was sewing for themselves and trying to draft or modify patterns to fit their own bodies. And so that's the approach and it's exactly what I needed. So her skirt sloper is very similar, but it has two darts on each side of the front and two in the back. And then she has a video that explains how once you are going through your fitting, you might need to change to having only one dart on each side and move them, you know, so, you know, figure out where the placement might work better for you. So I tried this one and I, and, but on this one, I'm going to show you on the muslin. I don't know if you can see how there's that line going across. She said to take that hip line that you have in your sloper she said draw the hip line all the way across the skirt. That way when you're trying it on and you're looking in the mirror, you can tell if your skirt is actually hanging level or not. So that was fantastic. So I tried this on earlier today and I think everything fits, fits me correctly. One thing that I have trouble with is, you know, in, in these mock-ups, they never tell you to put the invisible zipper in you know, because they want you to, to use pins and adjust. And I finally realized, oh, this is why they're always saying in, in supplies that you need for sewing is that you should get some uh, safety pins because I was trying to pin straight pins into, into me and it wasn't working. And I was like, okay, I need safety pins. So in these skirt slopers, they always have you do your mock-up at sitting at the natural waistline. And I'm, I just need to decide, do I really want my skirt up that high? or do I want it a little bit lower? I did practice doing an invisible zipper in just some scrap pieces of fabric. And so and I got to use my invisible zipper foot, which I bought a couple of months ago. I was so excited when I found out those, that existed. So I think of all of this like swatching where I'm practicing things and then seeing what works well, what do I understand? And then where am I running into trouble? And now what do I have to look up next in order to figure out how to get this um, to work better. And usually everybody's got their own idea about how things work. The way I sew is the way I used to knit, which I taught myself to knit by just buying a, a sweater pattern that I liked and then following the instructions and then figuring it out. Like when they're telling me to do something that I've never done before, just follow the instructions um, and figure it out. Well, knitting patterns only tell you how to do the knitting part. Although these days with a lot of online patterns they might give you tutorials or links to things that will be helpful but a, a knitting pattern is going to tell you you know seam these two sides together seam this to here seam this to there like i was talking about in this 1960s sweater i 
needing to decide how I'm going to seam this together, what technique I'm going to use. They don't tell you because they don't really care. You can use whatever cast on you want as well. It doesn't matter to them. So these are choices that I get to make. But if they didn't tell me in the pattern, I wouldn't know to do anything other than what I already know. And that's the way it is with sewing patterns I've discovered is I have always been very good at following the instructions in a sewing pattern. You know, because they usually, the, I'm very good at just following instructions, but if they've got diagrams, I can, I can work out what to do. One of the things that always puzzled me was top stitching. I always dutifully did it, you know, top stitched as they showed in the diagram. And sometimes, but sometimes I'm like, why do I have to do this from the top? You know, I've got the same yarn in the bobbin as I have, you know, in the needle. Why do I have to do this from the top? It doesn't make any sense. And then I thought, well, maybe some people don't use a matching thread in their bobbin. Maybe they're just using white. And so they want to make sure that you're using, you know, your project thread in the top. I didn't know. I got an email from Craftsy this week telling me about a sewing class on like finishing techniques for sewing. And so I thought, oh, that'll be good because immediately what came to mind was finishing techniques for knitting, which is the techniques that you use that are going to give you the best finished results. They're not necessarily the techniques that you use once all of the sewing is done, like the final ironing or the final washing or the final this or the final that. It's like, what do you need to do as you go along in order to get the best finished results? So I knew that from having gone through the master hand knitting program and having a revelation about, oh, that's what finishing techniques means. So when I saw this with sewing, I went, oh, I'm gonna watch that. I was about four minutes into the video when my brain started like exploding because she was talking about top stitching. Apparently, you're supposed to use a different thread for top stitching, a little thicker thread, a longer, st a, a longer stitch, and a different needle. <laughs> and I'm like, I had no idea. I was like, what? I, you know, I had no idea. That was complete, complete news to me. That was amazing. Uh, and I will be watching. I, I had to stop the video and go and start researching uh, needles and threads and, and how to do this um, before I got any further in the video. Oh, the other thing was I did finish the t-shirt that I had sewn a couple of weeks ago. It's not up here. Again, I treat that as a swatch. Somebody mentioned a couple of weeks ago when I kind of held it up that there was this fold line down the center because I had cut my t-shirt and needed to be cut on the fold. And so I used the fold line that was already there. And they said, usually a lot of times that's a permanent fold line. You cannot get that out. So when you need to cut out on the fold, you want actually want to rotate the tube around. So those fold lines aren't going to be in your actual garment. And so thank you whoever told me that because I had no idea. And then, you know, I had a little issue with the collar at the bottom of the scoop. It was kind of, I'd stretched uh, the neck, the actual neck too much. And so it caused the it looks great everywhere else, just at the bottom of that corner. And I realized, okay, don't stretch it. And also I want a, a narrower neckband. Um, and then the last thing was that that t-shirt called for using a twin needle in order to finish the hems. And I happen to have a twin needle. I don't know why. Um, so I used that twin needle and it, and it didn't work very well and I was, you know, investigating it. And, you know, it's just, again, it's the wrong needle for the job. It's the wrong tw size twin needle, the wrong situation. And treating a lot of these things well as mock-ups and as swatches so that I can figure out what it is I don't know um, in order to get better. Because I've always been able to get through a project just fine, but not necessarily with, you know, results that I would consider you know, really good, which is why I was willing to do um, sewing projects uh, for my kids for Halloween costumes because it didn't matter. <laughs> but I, you know, I want to make clothes and I want them to look good. And so I'm doing a lot of this, you know, so practicing on scrap, on muslin, on old t-shirt material that I had in my stash from years ago. 
And so I'm just building my techniques at this point and hoping that in the next couple of weeks I'll ha actually have a garment or two that I'll be happy to wear out in public. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.